was a chief resident at a University of Chicago, or when I was a medical student at University of Chicago, the chief resident uh, boasted that he had basically gone through his entire residency without having to do a single DBS case. And uh, then I went to uh, Barrow and trained at Spetsa for seven years, I attended a bunch of Dr. Delashaw's and JD Day's and all these skull-based courses. And um, uh, now pretty much, you know, my main procedure doesn't require not only doesn't require a uh, microscope, but not even really loops. But um, it's, uh, you know, Dr. Rebus's slides are really exciting for someone like me because, you know, the skull-based anatomy, the, you know, cisternal anatomy that we look at so much as residents is really exciting. But Dr. Rebus really shows the networks. You can see those white matter tracks, which are circuits. And what deep brain simulation neuromodulation is all about is nodes and circuits, addressing these, the motor circuits, the mood circuits, the cognitive circuits. And you can really see that. You know, he was, talked a lot about the anterior nucleus. That's a target for uh, epilepsy. Uh, we saw a lot about the fornix. And uh, we finished a um, trial looking at Alzheimer's disease, deep brain simulation for Alzheimer's, uh, where we actually uh, ran the electrode right up next to the fornix. And you can see here uh, in the uh, slide on the left, uh, you had a very similar slide. It's like the F gator sequence uh, where you can see like black and white, the globus pallidus and the, let's see, do I get a, I don't see my mouse there. Oh. But there, there you can see that's a trajectory, that right, uh, red line. And the fornix is right behind it, nice black stripes. So we run it right next to the fornix and uh, we stimulate along this. And you can see on PET studies, increased metabolism when stimulating the fornix all the way out into the temporal lobes. And uh, right below the fornix is the hypothalamus. And this is a picture from uh, surgery for uh, Alzheimer's disease. We, we have an arterial line, so take a look at the uh, A-line, the uh, heart rate, as we start ramping up with the voltage. And this is, uh, this is pretty exciting in surgery to see. That I, I've placed 26 of these leads. You can see the numbers start marching right now. Every single one of those, left and right, in all 13 patients, uh, had this effect. It's the deepest, most contact, a little bit further away from the fornix, close to the mammillary bodies, right in the heart of the hypothalamus. So you can do some pretty neat things with those electrodes. And uh, right now, the, um, the data for the Alzheimer's uh, study is uh, kind of going around. But you can see we've already ramped up from 90s to 120 in our systolic. Uh, so we, we saw that in every case. But it's, it's very neat seeing this anatomy, kind of, you know, the, these, the circuits, the fornix, because uh, we're, we're seeing this all the time in MRI and targeting these. So I'm going to talk about uh, deep brain stimulation in 2016. Some things have changed. Um, and then talk about what uh, we call a sleep DBS and then a little bit about outcomes. So uh, DBS for Parkinson's, you know, as neurosurgeons, uh, again, it's the burr hole. Some people call it the eight-hour burr hole. Uh, that's not how we do it in Phoenix. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but it's important to appreciate as neurosurgeons that what we're doing in the operating room for, for Parkinson's has had the highest impact for Parkinson's disease since uh, levodopa was introduced in the late 1960s. And I'll talk about kind of what that means. You know, you think, what does it mean to treat Parkinson's with DBS? When a patient uh, is started on levodopa therapy, uh, their Parkinson's symptoms are improved. So this is a patient diary. I don't think I get the, so I'll kind of just show up here. Um, so on means that your symptoms are controlled. Off means that the symptoms are not controlled. Uh, 7 a.m., this is a diary. 8 a.m., 9 a.m., midnight, breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the bottom, and their medication regimen. So when patients have Parkinson's, and again, we don't really learn too much about Parkinson's as neurosurgery, neurosurgery uh, residents, uh, but um, as the disease progresses, they start needing more and more medication. They start having these fluctuations up and down where they can't predict when their symptoms are going to be controlled and when they're, they're going to be off. And they start developing dyskinesias, which are kind of wiggling around, wiggling around movements that are side effect of the medication, not the disease itself. So the dyskinesias and the motor fluctuations become major drivers of disability. And what deep brain stimulation does, it sort of captures that best response to uh, medication and stabilizes it. So on average, patients gain five more hours of on time without the dyskinesias. So a reduction of dyskinesias and increased on time. And this makes a huge difference for patients. Uh, it's been shown in randomized trials uh, through the VA. So the, the data is out there. It's safe. It's non-destructive. It replaces thalamotomy, pallidotomy, procedures that would actually destroy the brain. Uh, and as such, it's reversible. So if there's a cure down the road, uh, you can turn it off or take it out, and the anatomy is still there. And it's adjustable. So uh, to date, over 150,000 patients have been treated with this worldwide. 
Uh, there are a lot of patients with Parkinson's, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. There are a lot of, you know, with a growing population, it's, it's, a, real, uh, it's a real issue. Um, based upon the previous uh, labeling recommendations by the FDA, which is DBS for advanced Parkinson's, between 10 and 20 patients with Parkinson's are candidates for DBS. I put an asterisk there because that recommendation by the FDA just changed. Uh, but only about 2% are receiving it. So Medicare has recognized that deep brain stimulation is currently underutilized based upon the old uh, labeling. So I always emphasize to patients, this is not an experimental treatment. It's not a treatment of last resort. In fact, there's been a trial in Europe looking at earlier time points for intervention where the average age was 51 uh, in treating patients with DBS. They randomized patients to surgery versus no surgery. And patients with surgery did better, better quality of life, and those who had been randomized to no surgery wanted the surgery by the end of the trial. So last fall, the FDA changed their labeling for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. So to be considered a candidate, to be considered somebody for whom surgery would be an appropriate next step, uh, you have to have had dopamine responsive Parkinson's for at least four years, and then problems with medication for at least four months. So four years and four months. That really, that's a line in the sand. It's a lot earlier than what we had been doing before. So we're kind of moving into an era where it's prime time for DBS. It's underutilized and even more underutilized now based upon this new, uh, uh, these new indications. So why do people not uh, clamor over each other asking for this operation? Uh, it's brain surgery. You can try medications for a while. You can try new medications. You can kind of run around circles trying to optimize medications, whereas surgery has uh, risks. Uh, there's a fear of awake surgery. Traditionally, it's an operation that's done awake. Uh, there's a self-image that you're going to have this implanted device. You can feel it under your skin, the little horns above the head, and uh, being inside the stereotactic frame for four, six, sometimes more hours, uh, so perhaps a loss of control. And all this can contribute to people kind of delaying this, uh, this option until you know, their late 60s, mid-70s, and then finally, once they're already, already disabled, uh, electing to proceed. So. Um, the uh, current workflow, you put the frame on. Uh, the whole idea behind the stereotactic frame is to be able to say, this is where I want to go in the brain and get there about seven centimeters deep through a hole about the size of a dime. Uh, traditionally, uh, patients undergo microelectric recording, testing, and surgery. And uh, some neurosurgeons in town refer to this as the uh, eight hour burr hole uh, that they're still scarred from from their years uh, in uh, residency. Uh, so the, the recordings and the testing can be kind of the source of variability in terms of how long this operation takes. So why do we do it this way? Uh, when th this surgical procedure really adopts a lot of the techniques that were used during ablation. So ablation, you know, you're actually destroying the brain. And when you destroy the brain, you can't unring that bell. So there are steps that were taken to ensure the safety of this procedure using electrical stimulation to make sure that they're in the right spot and that there weren't side effects that were going to result from, from a lesion. And the... Uh, MRI available at the time, uh, you know, MRI really took off in the 1990s, did not show the anatomy as clearly. Uh, so basically, you'd kind of start with a ballpark based upon three cadavers dissected, you know, over 50 years ago in France, and then you kind of work your way toward the right target. So there's a lot of reasons why people consider uh, the need for awake surgery, brain shift, uh, stereotactic error, that the, it's a physiological target, so a target defined by the electrical physiological signature of the cells firing, uh, as opposed to an anatomical target. All of these have been used to kind of uh, justify the, uh, the need for patients to be awake during this operation. A sleep DBS is basically uh, combining two principles. One is so-called direct targeting. That means targeting based upon MRI uh, and intraoperative imaging uh, to verify that you actually hit that MRI-based target uh, intraoperatively. Uh, so the assumption with direct targeting is that you can pick the right target for uh, DBS based solely upon MRI, and you don't need to refine that target with a microelectric recording. And that's made possible with uh, newer MRI sequences, uh, not that new, uh, T2 FSE. You can see the subthalamic nucleus here, a trajectory showing that. And then you can modify the target from sort of a generic consensus coordinate to something that based upon what you see uh, on the MRI. Uh, similarly, you know, based upon decades of microelectric recording work uh, with the globus pallidus. Uh, you can use the data that's been gleaned from awake patients to refine the target uh, and identify directly using um, proton density or F gator sequences. So that's what direct targeting is. And really, it helps refine that target enormously. This is one patient where his 
GPI target is 25 millimeters almost uh, away from midline, whereas this one's 18. So if you're starting from like a generic coordinate, it could take you all day to kind of find your way to 18 or find your way out to 25. And uh, basically, if you uh, have insomnia, I have uh, various videos showing how to plan these different targets uh, on YouTube. So if you look up Ponce DBS planning, uh, there's GPI planning, VIM planning, and STN planning all up there. Uh, this is a, a video. Let's see. Yep. So this is, um, this is uh, Alex Whiting. He's one of our second year residents. His dad is the chairman of neurosurgery at, uh, at um, Allegheny. And uh, uh, we were on a panel together a couple months ago. And when Alex told me that we were going to, I was going to be debating his dad, his dad does DBS awake, uh, I, was, I basically made this video to use his son as a human shield. So this kind of shows the, um, uh, the workflow uh, of uh, asleep DBS. So the patient's already asleep. And what I have here is uh, the um, uh, number signature. You can see how much time is elapsing as we go on. So we're just starting the frame. And uh, so the, frame, the workflow is really nice. Everything happens in the operating room. Once the frame is in place, we don't move the patient. You'll see the body tome, it's behind us right now. Uh, we're leveling out using the iPhone, uh, leveling out the frame, making sure it's the right height. And you'll see next, that's the body tome. It's a portable CT scanner uh, that we use. And uh, basically, that's how we get the uh, stereotactic images. And we take an extra step where we kind of clip the hair based up on the uh, ring and arc. That's the Lexel frame. So all we're doing basically is doing the burr holes, putting the leads in. And once the leads are in place, we get a scan. So things are still open. We actually have the stereotactic frame arc uh, in place. So if we need to do a repositioning, the threshold for repositioning is very low. Bring in the scanner. And make sure that we like what we see. The CT scan, I'm looking at the electrodes. You can see all four contacts and then close. And uh, what we've been able to do is, um, you can see it's been about uh, two, two hours, 40 minutes into the procedure right now, and now we're doing the battery. So we can do both sides in a battery in the morning and again in the afternoon. And uh, this really increases the, you know, patients just kind of go in once, they go to sleep, they wake up, everything's implanted. Traditionally in the United States, DBS is done in multiple stages. Uh, a large reason for that is um, uh, reimbursement uh, by the hospital. So then we're done uh, three hours into it. So. Uh, so the portable CT scanner is what we use. Uh, we use the serotome initially. Now we use the body tome, which is a larger gantry. Uh, I'm excited to see that we're going to be using the Arrow. Uh, that's the Brain Lab's uh, new system. Uh, very large gantry. Uh, there's the O-arm. Uh, you can't register with the current O-arm, but my understanding is you will with the new one. And this is what it looks like, uh, the four contacts on the um, stealth station. And to date, I've done, uh, we're almost at in April, we're going to hit our 500. I'm going to hit my 500th patient. But you can see those uh, dots, and what this tells you is right there, 0.7 millimeters. This tells you how far off you are. So you use this basically to say, all right, I've defined where I want to go, and then getting the intraoperative CT scan, I can show what my error is relative to where I wanted to go. And you can see anatomically where that electrode is placed relative to the um, MRI anatomy. And combining these two principles, direct targeting and intraoperative imaging, is what we've uh, we've been able to explore doing this without recordings, doing it under general anesthesia, not using test stimulation as a crutch to verify that the, the tr tremor stops because basically what we find is that if we hit the right target, the tremor stops. And a lot of people talk about shift. I'm not going to go into the, all the arguments that we uh, reviewed earlier and the, kind of the response, but basically our median pneumocephalus is zero. So there's technical uh, uh, modifications you can make to really reduce the amount of CSF you lose. Uh, and the uh, two-thirds of my practice now is asleep, and last November I stopped doing awake. So basically, instead of having going through the informed consent of asleep versus awake, I tell patients, I do this asleep, um, and if you want it awake, people, other people do it awake. That's an alternative. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about targeting. Uh, there's a lot of nuanced uh, issues between VIM, which we use for tremor, globus pallidus, STN, which are the two um, uh, Parkinson's targets. And then uh, other targets include things like fornix for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, age is uh, usually, it's, my average age is about uh, early 60s. Uh, accuracy, you know, it's great if you hit your target accurately, but if you pr pick the wrong target, it doesn't matter. So you, if you pick the right target, then you want to demonstrate you hit it accurately. And with the Lexel frame, we're getting about one millimeter error on average, which is good. 
And basically, I think all these frames, you know, it's, it's a matter of comfort. We have like four Lexcel frames for DBS and three more for Gamma Knife. So we're kind of a Lexcel center. Uh, this is our uh, asleep outcomes, uh, where we basically, what we want to show with DBS is not just that it's safe, we want to show how we close that gap. So again, this is that, uh, that patient diary, on versus off. And what we want to show with DBS is that we're closing that gap between on and off uh, in patients. So that percentage is how we measure the success of DBS. And those numbers have been pretty well uh, uh, described in uh, the randomized trials. And what this basically shows is, uh, over here on the right, the, um, you know, our, our results, Mers at all, 40.3% 40, 40 improvement, really matches what you expect with uh, traditional awake surgery. So uh, we do six-month outcomes for all of our DBS patients, and we've compared a sleep versus awake. We don't see a difference, uh, and that's really informed the uh, transition to being an, a sleep center. Uh, and the question kind of that we address is, does our ability to verify where we, that we're hitting our target, which has not been po possible before without intraoperative imaging, to really show, indeed, you're actually where you said you wanted to go, uh, does that re reduce our reliance upon having patients awake and doing a microelectric recording? Uh, the key to having good DBS outcomes is to have good lead placement. That's uh, my job, do it safely, do it accurately. The neurologists do the patient selection and they do the post-op programming. And it turns out when people don't respond to DBS, either they don't have the right disease, it's not real Parkinson's uh, oftentimes, or in half the situations in the uh, University of Florida, it's because they didn't even hit the, hit the target. What this means is that just by looking at an MRI in a patient with DBS, you can predict why it is that the patient's not responding, saying, all right, you know, relative to anterior commissure, posterior commissure, you're off. You know, what does it mean to be off based upon MRI? You don't have the awake data, you don't have the microelectric recording data, but a lot of that, in some regards, might be moot because if it doesn't look like it's in the right place, you know, and the patient's not responding, you kind of find that yourself in this dilemma. If a patient, if you hit your target and you have a good response, that's what you want. You might not get the right target, but you might still have a good response. In that case, you're lucky. You know, if you throw an air ball, but the patient's still doing fine. If you're hitting the right target, but the patient's not responding, that's when you start looking, did the patient have the right diagnosis? Does they need, do they need better programming? Are the medications off? But the box you don't want to fall in, this kind of prisoner's dilemma, like two by two matrix, is where you didn't hit your target and you're not getting a good response. So kind of using the logic of this is kind of what's driven me toward that, you know, Basically, what I want to show in surgery is that I've hit my target. And other uh, intraoperative imaging technologies have really reduced the need for revision, whether it be shunts, you know, using navigation, uh, pedicle screws, where uh, increasingly people are using navigation and uh, using O-arm spin for before and after, verifying that they've placed their uh, screws right. And I think the key here is having that low threshold for revision. If you close up and you send them to MRI and you check out the MRI and you're not in the right place, it's going to take a lot more to say, you know what, let's go back and redo the surgery. If we're getting this picture at the time of surgery that, and the patient's still open, it's very easy to make a change right then and there. And that's what we're finding. So that threshold is low to make a revision using intraoperative imaging. So currently, uh, DBS is underutilized. So it's a huge opportunity. These are elective patients. They do great. Uh, they kind of, you see them once and they're ready for surgery, you do the surgery and you see them a few more, couple more times and they're very grateful. And those changes uh, that you make with them last basically the rest of their disease. Their disease progresses, but the symptoms that respond to DBS persist for decades. Uh, using anatomical targeting challenges some of the tenets of awake surgery, and uh, a sleep DBS may render this therapy more accessible. So um, overall, uh, the use of DBS is going to keep increasing, not just for existing indications like Parkinson's and tremor, uh, but we're also exploring other uh, applications such as Alzheimer's disease. There have been trials looking at it for uh, depression, Tourette's syndrome. A lot of places do it for Tourette's pain. So uh, happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.